Hi guys, this is Rob from the Smoke and Mirrors podcast, introducing a new project that I've been working on. This one's called On Record. It's about interviewing really interesting new and upcoming artists in the film industry, talking about their journey and how they sort of got their foot in the door. I'm really excited to share it with you and I hope you guys enjoy. Let me know. Tolly here, um, a filmmaker who has uh, grown up in the UK, born in the UK. Um, you moved to New Zealand, moved to Sydney, moved, you've moved around a lot. Um, you've worked on a couple of the biggest movies in the last 10 years. Um, and you're also um, a, a close friend of my brother-in-law, Weaver. Um, and that's, that's where I met you. I think I made uh, a vegetarian pizza for you. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, I do remember that. A few years ago, but yeah, it must have been a very yeah. good pizza. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's. I think it's been, yeah, nearly 10 years or so, but two kids later. Uh, Congratulations. <laughs> I've, um, yeah, so we're, we're catching up again. Um, so I've, I've, I've brought you on, Lee. Thank you so much for doing this interview. Um, I've brought you on because I've just done a review for Black Widow, um, which I enjoyed. Um, and you, you actually worked on it. I did. I'm very lucky. I got the call from um, a production manager, line producer that I've worked with in New Zealand, who'd relocated over to London. And it was uh, we had a good experience on a show that we, we worked on in New Zealand. And she said, hey, what are you up to? What are you doing? I've got this job coming up. If you can pull a few things together, um, there's a space for you. Um, I didn't need much more uh, impetus than that. The sponsor heard what the role was. And we were lucky enough to shoot in Morocco yeah. before the pandemic. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I got myself back to London, uh, met up and yeah, we were, we jumped on a plane, um, before we knew it, we were in Tangiers, um, and shooting a, a section as with all of these, these big tentpole films. Now, uh, there's a central, some of it may be studio based generally over in London or the U S but then there's a lot of exterior shots are done in Prague or Florence or Abu Dhabi and, and these all add that sort of the the largeness to the film and we were lucky enough to to get the morocco leg which was absolutely amazing experience not only as a filmmaking experience but actually to be dropped into a a country that was um i guess the border of spain france arabic english language lots of different languages um yeah, yeah. great great experience and then the filmmaking experience on top of that was um was uh, yeah, one one of the highlights of, of the career, working with such a talented pool of Moroccan t uh, crew that had been through, I think they did Quantum of Solace, they've done maybe the second or first wow. Mission Impossible, but they get to do a lot of um, big movies over there because of the locations in Morocco and the closest proximity to Europe. So yeah, all in all, top experience. That's awesome, man. Um, so would you like to... Before we jump like into more of the Black Widow centric questions, would you like to just give us a little bio about, about yourself, about your journey as well, up until this point? Hundred percent, sure, yeah. So I guess my my very very first memory of being on a film set, I think I might have been four or five, and we were on a uh, trip to Malta with the parents, and there was uh, a set that was still made by um, there was a film Robin Williams was in, it was a Popeye remake. And I just remember yes. it being this most amazing beachside fishing village and just being completely inspired by it. And it, I just remember being awestruck. Very, very small. Um, but yeah, four or five. Very, very, um, yeah, very young. So that, I think, it was in the blood um, from, from that point <laughs> onwards. At school, I remember going to the careers options like and said, I want to be in film. I want to be in film. And I, I actually, when I was back at my parents' house, last trip back to London, I found the form up in the loft there and it said, we strongly recommend that you choose an alternative career path because it's too competitive. 
<laughs> and this happened two years in a row. So I think I listened to him for a while and I went down a different avenue and traveled a little bit and was lucky enough to see a fair bit of the world. And um, it got to that crunch point. I think it was late 20s and it's like, what are you really doing with your life? Fairly successful in a, a career before film. And it was like, well, no, I want to do something that's creative. I want to do something that I'm passionate about that gives me that that sense of awe and, and bliss. And that's that Joseph Campbell thing, follow your bliss. So um, that was when I took the step to get out of the comfort zone, go back and study and started film school down in Sydney, which is where I met Weaver and, and Bucky, your brother-in-laws. And um, I'd like to say I learned a lot there. I think I unlearned more than I learned, if you know what I mean, just sort of deconditioned how I thought the world worked. And um, had two years, two, two and a half, oh, three years really, a, a couple of different film schools down there, just experimenting and just no rights, no wrongs, following your intuition, following your subconscious, um, learning the practical skills as well, which is really important. Um, like the editing, the, the actual filming, the lighting, the scripting, all of the, the components. But um, I think the most important part of it is that you get to have this introspective aspect of yourself because you're writing something. You're not really sure what you're going for, but you, you step out into the world, you make it, you get that reflection back with the, the camera on the world, and then you get the chance to edit it. So it's a really healthy um, pursuit. I think as a as a growth as as a human being, so I think that's yeah. what I took the most out of the actual creative experience. And then you start again when you start in the in the business side of things in the real world. You start from the bottom yeah. and you, you make coffees and go from there. That's awesome, man. That's really inspiring. Was it scary for you making that change from like, okay, I'm I'm successful, like I I could stay in this career progression for the next, for the rest of my life, but I'm not passionate about it. Was it scary then jumping into this, this world that you didn't really have a foot in the door, but you're willing to, to do the work? A hundred percent. Um, and also it was inevitable that I couldn't carry on that path. So it was, it's almost that duality of, of what it means to be a human being. You crave the comfort, but you also crave the risk and the excitement. So the risk and the, the growth or maybe the soul journey overtook at that point. Uh, yes, it was comfortable physically, but I knew there was more. Part of me knew that there was more. Didn't necessarily know what that looked like, but it was the force of that was overtook the, the fear. So, yes, it was, definitely. And I think that the hard thing is that you, you do lose some acquaintances. They were probably classed as friends at that, that time, but they can't understand when you say no a few times because you're, you're starting to put your focus in different areas and you, you're not quite as social because you're maybe funneling funds into a different, different avenue. That's quite hard. But then the real friends that emerge, the new friends plus the, the people that see you for who you are stand by you as well. So I found that quite tricky. Yeah. That's that's quite emotional, yeah. in a way, because you you are letting go and and losing some people that maybe aren't serving your new journey. Or yeah, wow, yeah, I I would have experienced that as well. Just changing roles over the last couple of years, and it's only the people that cared about you as a person, not that the role that you're performing, actually stuck around. Um, geez, and. It's crazy. You followed this passion, right? And through through the course of, I'm assuming, film school, you made six short films as well. And they all ranged from, like, drama to crime to comedy. Um, lots of different themes in there with, fa with family, journeys, um, self-discovery. Um, how much of that is from, like, within, from yourself that you, you put into these shorts? There's a there's a phrase that you hear banded around as you have to get yourself out of the way to start making the films that need to be made. Um, and I think film school is that process. You go in, everyone wants to be a director. Everyone has got this firm idea of what they need to do in this almost autocratic, this is 
uh, this is the way it needs to be done. This is what I want. But somehow, sometimes that can be forced and it's, um, it's not the story that wants to be told. So over that period of the wow. two years, you, you break down that, um, that ego or that, that part of yourself that is in the way of the story that wants to be told. And I think the best filmmakers are the ones that allow and accept and surrender to what the stories are because it's a collaborative, creative endeavor. So it takes more than just the single person and the directing vision. The vision is important, but everybody collaborates and everybody brings a little bit of themselves to a good film. And I think that's what makes it magical. So for, for me, the two years of film school was breaking down and learning that and then allowing what is there on the day. Who's who's the people on the day? What, what do the actors, what's their version of it? But does the cinematographer have a different view? They've just seen something that I haven't seen with regards to an angle or a, a push in to get a, a piece of emotion. Um, so to answer your question, I would say, again, it's, a, it's an unlearning process. You're, you're learning techniques and you're, you're learning how the universe works. And like I say, the best filmmakers that I've worked with, they, they just very much allow um, and they ask, they don't dictate. So that's the biggest lesson that I've, I've learned from that creative process. Wow. And do you, do you also find that like when, when there's a director that's told what to do, it inhibits the process? Yeah. They don't necessarily last too long. I've just worked yeah. with a, 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 an amazing world Oscar winning director and the, the process was just amazing to be around and he's continually sculpting is the best way to, to describe it. You're sculpting the story um, and That's allowing crazy. allowing what, what needs to happen to happen. You're working from a blueprint. Everyone's got the script. Everyone's got their interpretation of it and perspective of it. And you need the, the, the leader who's got that vision to, to, to pull it to, to what it can be and, and reach that potential. And, yeah, I do. I think the, the best directors in the world are, are those type of um, allowing – they allow people to be the best of their ability to what they bring to the crew, whether it's the production designer, the costume designer, the actors, everybody. Yeah, it's a big, it's an yeah. ecosystem as opposed to a hierarchy. A good film, good film set. Hmm. That's that's awesome. It's because you hear so many horror stories. That's that's why I was asking. Like when, when I think about like Suicide Squad or, or Zack Snyder's Justice League or something, those are the like, you know, the more high profile ones that you hear about um, and, and what kind of happened there. Um, but it, it almost seems like it, it starts with me, the director, right? And then it ends with us, the, like the whole crew. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And um, working up through different... Um levels of filmmaking obviously film school everyone's in it to start with and you learn by mistakes you learn by your failures and like everything in life you, your, your failures are your major successes as if you can look at it in that, that way yeah and it's hard for people to work through their failures eh? yes yeah that's the resilience factor that's the um that's where you do need support from your family community um, and that's vitally important in this process massively so you you worked on some some really big shows like tv shows as well from shannara chronicles catching malat and even funny girls with um rose matafeo who weaver just introduced me to actually and she's hilarious because we just started watching um starstruck on hbo um do you find there's a big difference between um the set for a show and movie um yeah once they start getting i i think with the there's a risk factor there, there are some exploratory so some of the comedy stuff yes it's scripted but it's exploratory to see what lands and you've got that freedom with a lower budget to to express yourself and try something maybe be a bit more risky um which is 
fun. It's it's so such good fun. And then yeah. the bigger ones, there's obviously millions of dollars being invested to something, and it's more like a process loan. You've got your um, you got your job that, and your role that you're being paid for, and you execute that to the to the best of your ability. When that comes together, so they're very different processes, both equally as enjoyable. Um, with yeah, I couldn't. I, I like switching between the two of them, just to keep fresh. I think if you did one type for the rest of your life, you it could end up like being a job. You're going in and yeah. you're you're doing the same bit on the production line every time. So it's still incredibly exciting for you. Yeah, hundred percent. Like you, you, the resources are available for something like the missions impossibles and the yeah. They're absolutely amazing. You see some of the the stunts and the the set pieces, and you know this is the only place in the world this is happening right now. And you're pushing the the endeavors of humanity. If you look at what um, uh, Tom Cruise is proposing to do with, they went from a halo jump in the last Mission Possible to potentially doing a outside of the atmosphere in the next one. This is this is history making within filmmaking at the same time. So. Uh, obviously, yes, yeah, it's, it's a privilege to be involved with any anything like that. So yeah. yeah, I mean, he's also like aiming to go into space to shoot a movie completely in space with Doug LeMann or Lyman. It's crazy, and it's that power of creativity, creative thinking of um, well. What if? Really and that's that's probably the biggest takeaway from film school through to to the right. big films that you're working on. You get to play what if? Well, what if we do this? What if we? And no, it isn't necessarily off the table. You know, it's just uh, let's explore. Let's let's do this. And that I find is another really privileged position to be in. It's, there's not many yeah. professions you can do that. In. That's so cool because you've you've worked on like some of my favorite movies in the last 10 years. So uh, if we look at Gods of Egypt, which was one of the most underrated gems, you got Gerard Bartley, you got Nikolai Costa Waldo. Um, I think Brenton Thwaite was, Thwaites was in that one. Um, directed by Alex Proyas, the guy that gave us The Crow and Dark City. Um, it's, it, it's got the hero's journey in there completely realized. Um, it's fun. It's sort of like it's a callback to some of the the old Ray Harryhausen flicks, Clash of the Titans, that sort of like mold. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, you worked on Mulan. You worked on, like you said, Mission Impossible Fallout, um, which is like the dark night of spy films. It's like it was almost like it, it recreated and wildly all these movies like. They, they're getting better as they're going on, which is weird for a, um, a series of movies. And, and more recently, Black Widow. Um, were there any movies that you wish that you worked on? I have one minor regret. Um, I just left the UK and I was in transit when I got a call for Phil Pullman's trilogies, the, um, the Subtle Knife. Uh, the, the TV series I've just made with Daphne Keane um, and Lynn Manuel Miranda over in the UK, oh. which is they've done it well. I think when they made the film, they made one out of the three books. It didn't quite land, um, but yeah. this time it's it's yeah. Uh, so I had a decision to carry on for somewhere else or, or go back. And sometimes I'm like, I look back at that show and it's, it's very well done. And at the time you don't know whether, yeah. what it's going to be like. So that's one that I don't like regrets, regrets. Uh, you, you wouldn't, I wouldn't be here now if I'd made a different decision maybe, but yeah. um, that's one it's I true. do look back at. Um, I feel really lucky. I, th I feel like, um, yeah, right place, right time. Um, one of the things about film is, it seems to gather the right people for the right project. It's just, um, you obviously can't take every job in the whole entire world because they overlap. Just the schedules of one might finish after you've started one and all that kind of overlapping. But yeah. I've, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm okay. I'm content. Um, but with yeah. plenty more to look ahead in the future, for sure. Definitely want to. Yeah. Yeah. 
it it seems like almost every second big Hollywood production is coming down to Australia to shoot. Sure. So it it, it doesn't seem like you're going to be running out of work. You know what I mean? I think it's testament uh, to the safety at the moment, just and, and the perceived safety. Yeah. More people that come down and realise the quality of the, the the crew that are working here, the facilities, the um, locations. Um, Russell Crowe's just talking about expanding in Coffs Harbour, the studio there. So it's another asset to Australia. Um, yeah. yeah, acting talent obviously has travelled across yeah. across the seas. That um. That facility that Russell Crowe's proposing or, or backing um, is, is amazing. Like, it's even got lodging on the set for, like, the crew. Like, let's say if they needed to quarantine or whatnot, it's there. You know what I mean? It's like a resort-type vibe, too. Sure. I haven't looked as well, – you've obviously looked into it probably a little more than I. Um, yeah, I read a little bit about it. But it's, the, again, the kind of vision that you need to be able to – A, he leaves a legacy – and then, yeah, you're, you're creating jobs and a, a culture and a, a future for, for filmmakers here. So, yeah, full power to them. Especially in the current climate with COVID as well. Like, he, it's almost a, a sort of workaround with the lodging, I find. Yeah, it is. And then it also speaks to like, just generations of kids that are growing up with, um, with the power to create story like TikTok's a story, Instagram's a story. Like it's in the, yep. in the common vernacular and the skills are there. I can remember seeing a kid on my yeah. bus once and he was jumping between Photoshop, Garage Band and editing on Final Cut Pro all, all simultaneously. And I'm like, where does he get these skills? He's, he's about 12 years old. Yeah. You know? yeah. Humbling. I reckon. Um, so have you ever worked on a, a, a set um with covid protocols on them yeah yeah um yeah the current ones are all um taking it very seriously obviously they're protecting everyone's livelihood plus the um the investment that's going in it's in some aspects it's not really any more restrictive it's just people taking responsibility for for themselves and for the people around them um and yeah by by and large, it's being done really well, um, and I think it's again talks to why there are more films coming down here because people can recognise that the people are here are taking it seriously. Um, it's protecting everybody, and thus far, it's, it's it's changing as we speak. But um, so far, we've been fairly immune to it compared to the the ravages the rest of the world have seen. So, yeah, yeah. it's helping. It's helping the Australia. Film, Australian film industry and Australia in general, I think, with them coming in, it's it's strict enough, but yep. it's not over the top. But it's yeah, no. good, good, yeah, Goldilocks, Goldilocks amount. <laughs> um, so, what what part of Black Widow did you did you work on? Do you, we were saying the the Morocco leg. So yeah, we had Morocco leg. It's mostly um, Elena's parts and where she met a few of the the widows for the first time. It's quite a an action orientated piece um, and set her up as the um, I guess the sniper and the, some of the skills that she's got out yeah. in the world. So it was very much chosen for the richness that Morocco has and. Uh, I'm not sure how much you know about Morocco, but there's a um, there's a casbah there that's way back. I think William Burroughs lived there for a while. Jim Morrison lived there for a while. Rolling Stones lived there for a while. Jeez. It was a whole um, permissive um, scene, I guess, in like the 40s and 50s, even where homosexuality was still banned in the UK. So I think a lot of people went over to. Um, to, to Morocco just to live the life that they could. And the Casbah yep. and the, the markets there are still there from, from back in the day. So that was the location that wow. we, we stayed in. We're lucky enough to stay right on the edges of that in a, a very nice hotel that, to, to movie folklore, was the, the hotel was supposed to have inspired um, Rick's scene, Rick's bar in Casablanca, even though it wasn't oh, in wow. Casablanca. So there's a whole movie lineage to it. And it was a it was an amazing experience. Just uh, that's crazy. Yeah, man. 
So you were a production coordinator. Yes, on that one, yeah, yeah. And what 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 is that? What is a production coordinator? So the role on that one. Um, so we obviously have um, like the the main unit or the main parts of that film were we were based out of London, basically. So we needed to get everybody over there. We needed to get um, all the equipment over there. So, for example, all of the hero props, all of the hero costume, all of that needs to to come in ahead of schedule. So we need to maintain the, the shoot that's going on in different parts of the world. Budapest had just finished. Um, they're still shooting stuff in London. Um, we needed to orchestrate when the actors could get over to finish their parts that they were doing in London when they could get in when there was enough time for rehearsal. We get permissions from the local Moroccan um, uh, up to the sort of the king in some areas with regards to permissions to shoot in certain areas. And so it's just basically, it's a bit like a Le Mans start on a, on a racing track. So when the, the crew come, the shooting crew, it's just seamless. So they can just continue soon. So we we shot the days there and then they fly back out again. And uh, I think it was was over to the States just to finish off after that. So, yeah, it was a nice, um, you you get to see a section of it, which was amazing. But obviously the ambition now is to be part of something for the duration and get moved around in these in for the for the duration of a show like that so yeah it's always yeah okay. stretch goals but as a as experience it was amazing yeah um and a lot of it a lot of it's uh liaising with, with the people on the ground and the paperwork side of things everything's got to be reported back to to the um studios in london and yeah the less glamorous okay. side of it as well sitting in front of a computer okay but but still something that like you know is is absolutely essential to that production going seamlessly as you were saying. Man, so what what would be like a, a day in the life of a production coordinator? Um, day in the life of a production coordinator. I, probably the best way to summarize it is you you're there to make everybody's job smoother and and to, to help out their day so it can probably three to four hours of it is anything that comes up in the day it could be look we need a new lens for such and such because we've now decided that we need to do a close-up and the 35 mil lens wasn't working we need to go down to a 25 we may not have it in, in the kit or all of the uh, the day-to-day running of things and just interfacing with camera team uh, are generally self-sufficient, but sometimes our production, uh, uh, sort of costume, makeup, all of these guys we do do the call sheets quite often, um, which is working out depending on which country you're in. But yeah, we correlate the call sheet, which is basically just the run sheet of what's going to be happening in the day, what scenes are going to be shot, who's going to be in them, what time everyone needs to be there, what time everyone's going home. And then end of the day is once the day's done, you you collate in the, the daily uh, progress report, which then goes back to the studio to say, hey, look, we were aiming to do this today. We did achieve this. Uh, this shot maybe we couldn't do because the sunlight wasn't quite right. This might have to be moved on to later on down the show or or everything was shot successfully. So it's uh, a bit more li- li- the liaison with the, the main producers um, and being that sort of on the ground eyes and ears that can report back to the guys back in the, the main office. Right. Okay. Jeez. So you're, you're pretty close to props. Oh, another job. Um, yeah. So that's the domain of, um, props master would, yeah, they, they have their, their own budget. They have their own, um, means of communications with different people and yep. so in different roles i've been a lot closer to that um the production coordinator wouldn't know the ins and outs have a bit of an overview of what the, the major ticket items are but everyone knows their roles so well they they go into the specificities of of their role yeah okay 
That's awesome. Because I, I I was just thinking like like if I was close to props or anything, like man, it'd be so tempting to just take something, <laughs> yeah, just a little souvenir for the film. <laughs> uh, have Have you ever gotten anything? Like I know that a lot of um, a lot of films especially with Marvel, they give them like uh, they give the crew a, a gift bag or something for like when the shoot finishes or. Yeah, sure. We had a nice gift from Henry Cavill on um, Mission Impossible where I'm sure you can remember there was the spat about, he had the moustache there for a while and I think he was shooting yeah. a man of steel where he didn't have to have, uh, no, he had, oh, what was it? he didn't have to have it on the character they had in Mission Impossible, but I think Mission Impossible Paramount had him on the contract first. So he sent us a nice gift, which was a medal with him parachuting, and the parachute was his his moustache. So that's pretty pretty nice nod to um, to that little experience that he went through. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, do you just in general find it hard to move around? Like with with your role, and, and you've done a lot of moving around in the past. Not before COVID, everything was fine before COVID. It's a little trickier yeah. now, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, as I guess to be to be confirmed, I, I've just finished a job now, so I'm due to be travelling again fairly shortly. Um, and I haven't actually been on a plane for a good probably eighteen months, which is very rare so yeah yeah okay. it, it don't, i think it is paying to be geographically in one spot um for most people at the moment just to consolidate their safety and yeah yeah um because i was gonna ask, do you do you resonate with like the character of black widow natasha just in terms of um she's kind of nomadic um She's big about family as well, because um, I know that you you also did a seminar, a series of seminars or, or workshops, um, where you talked about um, bringing uh, parts of characters or the hero's journey back into your everyday life. Um, how how did you kind of resonate with with Natasha Romanoff? I think um, all successful characters have that. The reason we go to, to watch a movie is to recognise ourselves in the characters, yeah. And there's 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 that aspect of her, she was escaping something, and I, I think um, I think we all do to a certain extent. We 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 can learn to be a bit more honest when somebody is sitting up on a screen that is saying something and you resonate with. It, I'm like, well, in the past, yeah, because I've been a little nomadic, you you can escape from something even though that's not your it might not be your your design but it, it makes you think and i actually only read that line i haven't seen the film yet i need to actually go and see it um but i read the line yesterday and i'm like yeah that that did remind me of a, a mirror of like am i escaping from something by by doing this and i i want to see it. i need to get out i had a few messages from friends saying they they enjoyed it and it was a um, well, not a return to form as such, but just a strong, strong addition to the to the Marvel canon. So um, I watched the first episode of Loki yeah. last night just to get back into it, and um, yeah, I might try and get to see it this weekend, and I might be able to answer your question a bit more thoroughly once I've seen the once I've seen the the edit of the thing. But as a character, yeah, yeah, I think everyone's got this kind of carving your own life in the world away from your parents kind of thing. You know, you you want to make your impression on the world and she's done that yeah yeah and and also well you see in age of ultron she leaves the red room right and then joins the avengers and the red room could have been your career before film you know what i mean she wasn't passionate about it now you you've moved into something that you you love i hadn't made that connection so yeah thanks for bringing that up yeah but yeah <laughs> totally and she hasn't got that superpower either she she is the oh. ordinary as well, which I, I do mm. resonate with that as well. She's got skills and she's and, and adaptable. She's 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 very adaptable. Um so we've talked about your your journey a lot. 
Um, but let's say someone out there wants to break into film, wants to work in the film industry. Um, they've asked their counselor like you did. Um, and they've said, choose another career path because this is just too, um, competitive. Um, what, what would you tell someone that's looking to break into the film industry? I think you have to really dig deep and locate your passion. It's not the type of industry that you can just mosey along, try it out without being dedicated. Yeah. And I, I'd, I'd say if you if you do that soul searching early, and it, it's something that you, there's no harm in trying it. But if you can locate that that sense of passion, you've got to go for it. You, you just have yeah. to. Like you've got this yeah. one one chance to to carve your way in the world, but you you're also bringing your ancestors' stories through, which is if you which is an absolutely amazing um, privilege to to be able to tell stories that um, are people that are long past, and then you've got a legacy in the future if if you can leave that to somebody else to be able to inform their journey, and ultimately I think we're all on. A very similar journey and and we use stories as a reflection for um for helping us along our way so if if you're if you're that passionate about it a lot of a lot of people are wanting to be in this profession yes it's going to be really competitive but you're doing an amazing service to the world by by telling these stories and helping people along the way so do it just yeah just just do it um, you'll soon know if it's not for you for whatever reason and it's the sort of thing maybe you, you, you can start it and people go off in different avenues for maybe a year or so and explore something else. But ultimately, it's a great way of expressing your life journey and leaving something for for those to reflect on once you've gone. So, again, really privileged um, profession to be working in. Yeah, man, that, w- that was really inspiring. Thanks heaps, man. Um, so we've we've seen like in the in the last couple of months, um, just theatrical releases, and and we've also seen a lot of digital distribution. Um, uh, even Black Widow itself had a simultaneous kind of middle of the road theatrical and digital. Um, what what are your thoughts on on it? Um, ultimately. The audience is king, and however the audience wants to um, engage with a product, with a product and a project, it's it's ultimately up to them. I think you've got to, yeah, it's a great experience sitting around with your far now and your sit with your family and sitting around and watching something in the comfort of your own home with pizzas and a coke and and watching that on the floor. But there's something special yeah. about going into the cinema as well. Like it's more yeah. of an occasion, and um, and I think that fully immersive um, experience can only really be had in the cinema. I, I think there's, there's space for both, and especially in this time where people are trying to work out where what's safest for for them themselves. I think simultaneous release is, as a business sense, is a really good option. Um, yeah. But ultimately there's something massively special about going to see a film that has been made to be on the big screen. And ultimately I think that's yeah. the, the art form and that's the cinema cinematic side of it. Yeah. Like I, I find if I'm in the cinema, I will enjoy it a whole lot more compared to when I'm at home. Um, it's like the images weren't meant to be just projected on my 55 inch TV. Like it hits different when it's like, this massive sort of 20 meter screen. Um, but I, I've been, I've been enjoying like HBO max has been doing like the theatrical and digital distribution all at the same time. So I've been watching those movies, um, at home just because like me, I've got a family, so I'm not going to go out as much and it's just hard to sort of, um, organize that. So it just, it works for me. Um, I don't, like, I don't know if, if that's the future post COVID when we get to that point. Um, but you know, I, I enjoy, I, I think that works for me personally 
with COVID or without? Well, it's um, great to have the options. And a few years yeah. back, we, or not even a few, a few months back, we didn't have the options. That, and mm. now it's empowering the, the audience to, to engage with the content that best suits them. So yeah. I think we get in there. And Netflix has been great yeah. for that with regards yeah. to, um, and for getting things made and the streamers, the, the stands and the binges and the Hulus yeah. and HBO obviously leading the world in narrative content, the, the quality, mm. the premium quality. Um, and it is a golden era of storytelling. It's, it's yeah. pretty lucky at the moment the content that's coming out it's hard to keep up with what's coming out to tell the truth that's the, yeah <laughs> that's the game yeah last week i swear there was like four movies that came out and i could i like i couldn't watch them all <laughs> you know what i mean like it's just and then every week now i think netflix drops something every friday um so let's say you got the green light to make anything that you wanted didn't matter about the budget whatever what would you make um, at the moment, I've got a, a an eight part TV series that I've been chipping away at in between some of these um, these projects, which stems back to film school era. One of the short films, so it was uh, something that's just grown from that, which was um, heavily influenced as influenced, aided and abetted by your brother in law there, Bucky and Weaver. We had a very good um, creative. Um, what do you call just understanding we just ended up helping each other out and sort of a synchronicity so um we just keep checking in with each other every now and again and love to work with those guys again in the future so that to me is also it's, a, it's something that's been with me but it's also a chance to work with film school people again like to as people are yep. going in their opposite directions you may not see each other for a year two years but there's yep. always that i'd love to just work with these guys again and the, yeah. the other people that keep doing it so that seems a bit like a, a bit of a homecoming kind of project um yeah. and i've also i guess long-term stretch guys i've got a bit of a, a game of thrones vikings kind of epic that maybe two or three projects oh. down the line um that would jump between probably like the, awesome. the norways and northern france germany uk states australia so it's yeah. diverse very much seeds of, of something that I've outlined, but um, yeah, you got to have these stretch goals. So that's that's the epic, and then yep. the kitchen sink drama on the lower budget. I think <laughs> that's crazy. I like that'd be awesome to see. Um, man, I think Vikings. You've, we've seen like a bit of a renaissance kind of um, over the last couple of years. That's that, that's kind of come out with Valhalla Rising. We've had the Viking show, yeah, um, sure. and a couple of other things as well. The game Assassin's Creed, yeah, um, Valhalla as well dropped. Um, but that that'd be exciting to see. Um, so, what's can you tell us? What's next for you? Um, I've I've literally just just finished one, so it's been nice to get back into the writing. Um, I'm stepping into a bit more of um, a pitching, yeah, starting to pitch ideas. Um, okay. So getting out, not not for too too long, but the next, uh, literally immediately when we finish this call, I've, I've got some pitching, practicing with, with some people that I've been working with long term. So there's always new skills. You, that's just the whole part of why this is, yep. why you look at the credits and there's now thousands of people's, people on there. But um, I'm just sort of honing my skills a bit more to bring some of these ideas through. I'm starting to get people um, uh, pitching to me some very, very good ideas. If um, I'd like to bring those other people's stories and those ideas to the forefront. Um, and again, keep keep speaking to Weaver. Like I'm, I'm happy to produce one of his scripts any day. He's a very talented man. So. Yeah, he is. just, keep, he just really keep, is. keep him writing. Keep putting that pen in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let him know straight after this. Thank you. <laughs> um, Lee, thanks so much for 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 coming on the on the show. Uh, we, I really appreciate it. Um, where can people find you if they if they wanted to track you down, see what you're up to? 
I'm Where's quite the... private. This is this is this is new <laughs> ground for me. I'm, I'm normally the, the the introverted writer of me sits behind a computer and is quite uh <laughs> quite happy there. But um, I guess the Instagram the yeah Instagram's probably the the one. Yeah. Place to find you. Yeah. Awesome. We'll we'll chuck it in the links as well. Yeah, good man. Um, is is there anything that you wanted to add? Um here just just for anyone going forward just just filmmaking is a collaborative effort and it's it's storytelling that's very core and anyone can do it um and this is the great thing about now though the, the gatekeepers to getting your story out there are just they've gone you can you can tell your story on social media on different platforms and the world needs to hear your voice everybody's voice you know there's no difference between me or the next man and, and we're all telling a version of the same story so get out there and do it yeah yes like listen to uh, watch other people listen to other people that are somewhere else on the journey but filmmaking's a doing sport you just got to go out there and do it and learn learn by doing so i encourage people just to get a camera and go out and do it awesome thank you so much thank you rob no thank you for the opportunity bro um yeah, I, I don't know how to end this. Um, this is my first interview ever. Um, but yeah, please go check out Lee um, and and some of the movies that he's done. And uh, are your shorts posted online on YouTube? Um, there's probably a couple on Vimeo. Uh, and there'll be a couple floating around. But um, yeah, it's, it's one of those things. They're, they're, once you've done them, they're lines in the sand, I think. It's, it's film school stuff. It's, it's great. But then there's a difference between what you you visualize and what comes out on screen. And I think that's the mark of a, yep. a, a filmmaker. And I'm, I'm still, yep. I've still got that to do. You know, that's my, I'm looking to the future. But yeah, they'll be able to find a, yep. There's a few bits and pieces on Vimeo. I'd encourage you to go see awesome. Weavers. They're some of the ones I'm proud of still. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, um, thanks again. Uh, and yeah, I'm I'm excited to see what what you guys we do in yeah. the future, man. Um, and yeah, take care. Thanks, man. I think um, my turn to get the veggie pizzas in next time. <laughs> For sure. Oh, right, brother. See you, man. Speak soon. Care. Catch ya. Bye. I had such a great time recording that with Lee. Uh, it was my first time talking to anyone that's worked on any film set. That's That's been uh, quite a massive production. Um, I'd love to keep these going. Uh, just hearing Lee is so inspiring. And I want to hear your story. So if you've got anything, uh, if you worked on a film set, if you're currently working on a film set, if you just want to get your story out there, this thing is going to help a lot of people. There's a lot of people out there with dreams. Um, and I really want to share your story with them to inspire them. Take care. Love yourself. Love movies. And I'll see you next time.